Leviticus 18, verses 25 to 28. When I read these verses, the three verses, uh, listen to a phrase that is repeating. There is a phrase that will repeat. I'm reading from NASB, um, NASB version. For the land has become defiled. Therefore, I have brought its punishment upon it. So the land has spewed out its inhabitants. But as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you, for the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations, and the land has become defiled, so that the land will not spew you out, should you defile it, as it has spewed you out the nation, spewed out the nation which has been before you. Okay? Uh, as Walsanagar reminded us, uh, this week we are going on a retreat, and I'm pretty sure you are all excited about it, and this is one of the highlights as he mentioned in our church life. And uh, this is not the first day he was reminding us to read from the book of Joshua. I mean, he has been saying this for a while, so I, I, I hope we are catching up on it. So one other thing when you read the book of Joshua, as I've been going through that book again, is that it is a very tiny book. It is kind of nicely tucked in between uh, Pentateuch, and then you have this historical book. Uh, even though it seems very simple and very narrative form, but it is one of the bloodiest books you can read in the, in, the, in the Bible. There are severe battles are raging in that book. And especially from a 21st century perspective, when you go back and read it, you will be horrified when you read it. Almost like when you read some of these verses, the land will spew, spew you out and things like that. It's, not, it's kind of foreboding for us from our cultural perspective to, to read some of this, particularly the book of Joshua. But you know the reason we read it today is not because we are called to do this kind of fight like a holy war or jihad. The Joshua is a book of jihad from a Christian perspective. They are basically going over and taking over a land, almost like the British invaded India or the Europeans invaded America. So, so it is kind of what is happening. It's a, it's a, it's a bloody, there are a lot of bloody incidents uh, happening and the wars happening. So we know that the relevance of this book is not for the physical aspects of it, whether we like it or not, the moment you decided to become a Christian, you have signed up to be in a war. And if somebody told you that when you become a Christian, you are going to be so blessed and your life is going to be so right, you will not get sick, you will always get the best job ever, you will always be wealthy and healthy and prosperous, they are trying to sell you something. Don't buy it because it's, it's a marketing pitch. It's not from the Bible. The moment you are being a Christian, you are stepping into a battlefield where a big war between the good and the evil, a cosmic battle between the right and the wrong, God and Satan is happening. We call it the spiritual warfare, right? Now, just because we arrived at the promised land, that's what we always hope for, right? We say, oh, we are going through this 40 years of wilderness. Our Christian journey, in some way, we, we use an analogy of that traveling through the wilderness. Finally, we will reach the promised land. When we reach the promised land, all, my, all, the, fulfilled, all the promise God gave me will be fulfilled. My life will be, you know, restful because... It is, the, it is the promised land. Not so. Not so in the book of Joshua. Now that is where they finally reached the promised land. 
Now, reaching the promised land is not the end of the war, and actually, it's the beginning of a different kind of war. And it, the battle keeps raging, not only in the book of Joshua, and then you go to the book of Judges, it just keeps, you know, there is no stop to any of this. So, again, if somebody sold you the idea that you will finally arrive at a promised land in a, in a, in a spiritual place where everything is going to be okay, you have to be suspicious because that's not the way the Bible is, the narrative of the Bible is taking us, teaching us, right? So there is this land in which this battle, the cosmic battle is going and we call it, you know, we try to avoid this kind of ling lingo, spiritual warfare and, you know, kind of spook some people out when you say there is a spiritual warfare. But that is the reality. There is a, you know, God and the, the Holy Spirit and the evil spirit are laying claims on this land. And in the end, you know, somebody has to win or somebody takes possession. And if the evil spirit takes possession, you know, then it is going to yield, the land is going to yield the evil fruit. And if the Holy Spirit is going to take possession of the land, then the land is going to yield holy fruit, right? In the same way, we know that in our own life, now we were, it's much easier for us to say that, yeah, there is this big spiritual warfare, man, like this is happening as if something that is happening in a different realm. Actually, the land of this battle is not just this big cosmos or this world, it is actually right here. This is a war that is happening within us. That's where it becomes very, very personal. So the book of Joshua can be reenacted in our own life because this battle is happening right here, right now, right? In our mind, in our heart, in our very, very being, the Holy Spirit and the evil spirit are laying claim on the human spirit, on the human spirit. We have the human spirit with the small yes, and the Holy Spirit is the, the spirit with the capital S, right? And so, so we, we are this battlefield. This is happening in the very being. So I will take you to the other words, which you probably know, and in the New Testament, it is very parallel to the book of Leviticus portion we read. The book of Leviticus is about the land becoming defiled and there's this battle going on and the land spew, spew you out if you are defiled, right? So here in the book of uh, the second uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5 onwards, uh, verse, okay, I'm going to read from 3 to 5, and you know this verse is very familiar. This is now personal, the, the same spiritual warfare happening within us. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty things raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now that is the battle we are fighting, not the Joshua battle, right? So this land or my being is, you know, if, if, if you use Paul's analogy, Paul always used this, you know, these two forces, he represent the, the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the flesh, right? The flesh and the spirit is this metaphorical language for the Holy Spirit and the evil spirit. Flesh means the evil spirit that is working in us or the carnal spirit that is working in us, which is driving us to the uh, darkness. Whereas the Holy Spirit is the spirit, you know, just the word spirit is used so that that's where, which is driving us to the light. Depending upon who is going to win this battle in our heart or in our being, we are going to yield the fruit of that, that spirit, right? Um, I'm pretty sure you know these verses, but still, just for the uh, fun of it, you know, the fruit of this, if, if the flesh wins, if the evil spirit wins from our heart, this promised land, so this is the promised land right now, okay? This being. 
from this being is going to yield, like you know, Galatians 5.19, you know, fruit of the flesh, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, and carousing. And these are some of the stuff, if that is happening, that is coming from inside our being, that really means that in this cosmic battle that is raging in within our being, the evil side is winning. The flesh, in Paul's language, the flesh is winning because he claimed the promised land. He is going to use that promised land to, uh, to do his own harvest, right? You know, he is going to use uh, to, to harvest his things there. And on the other side, if the spirit, if the, if the spirit with the capital S, which is the Holy Spirit, is winning, he's going to take over this promised land and he's going to, he's going to cultivate his fruit. These are his fruit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So now, this is not about the book of Joshua anymore. It is not about the book of Leviticus anymore. It is not even about the book of Corinthians anymore. It's about us. It is very, very, very personal. And we have to take seriously. This warfare is not something we can avoid, right? Now, the one thing we have to remember, now this is, this is where I, you know, I, I get a you know, raised eyebrow from many people when I say this. You know, this, this spiritual battle or the spiritual warfare, we are not fighting this war, okay? We are not fighting this war. Because there is a verse in the Bible which says, the battle belongs to the Lord, right? Because if we are going to really fight this war, there is no way we are going to win. Because the weapons of this warfare is not physical. It's not something you can use. It is like somebody giving you an AK-47 or whatever you see, hear about this, and you know, if I, if I can uh, load that gun or use that, there is no point about it. And there is no way we can win, fight a war and win between this big spiritual entities that is happening around us. Then what is our role? What is our role, right? If the battle belongs to the Lord, what are we doing? So there is this verse which always comforts me because I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, I'm, I'm not a very heroic person. Uh, you know, I, I'll be really worried about going to military and fighting an actual battle because I'm not that kind of a hero. So, um, you know, so, so, so the, the Lord kind of comforted me with a, with, a, with a particular verse, and I wanted to read it to you. Isaiah 49, verse 2, says this. Listen to this, Isaiah 49, 2. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has concealed me. And he has also made me a secret arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. What it says here is that I am not the fighter. I am not the soldier. I am rather a weapon in the hand of the real fighter, which is the Lord of the hosts. The Lord of the host means the Lord of the army. That's what it means. I am an arrow who is hidden in his quiver. And I am being continuously shaped and polished by the soldier so that he can use me at the right time. All I need to be aware of the fact that when I am put on a bow, when he is going to deploy me, the arrow, all I have to do is go and hit the target. That's all I have to worry about. I don't really have to be over concerned about the strategy of the war. I don't have to build up my muscles so that I can go and challenge the evil spirits and the all other spirits in the world. All I need to do is to be so concealed in the cover of the master and wait for that one moment. Now, this is where we all get, you know, an arrow. How many times an arrow is used? Only one time, only one time. There is a single, laser-sharp purpose for all our life. 
God is achieving so many things in our life. I'm not saying that you're not meant to do a lot of things. We are all meant to do many, many things. But at the very, very end, all these other things we are doing is actually a process of polishing towards that one single ultimate thing. That is the ultimate purpose of our life or it is the very center of our calling. And that is all that Adam has to be worried, worried, worrying about. Now, I had this concern a lot of time in my life. Even sometimes I struggle with the master. Master, what is happening? Because I'm hiding in his quiver. And I can hear this big battle raging. And I, I'm so impatient to get out and be there like everybody else. There are so many things are happening, Lord. What is, what is wrong with me? Why are you not using me? Am I not being polished? And I can see that you're polishing me. Now, when are you going to deploy me? And it's so strange, it's ironic. This is what it says. My mouth was, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. Okay. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. So what is the next logical thing to do? Send me out and destroy everything, right? Like, isn't that the whole idea? Now, the next verse is diametrically opposite. It says, in the shadow of his hand, he concealed me. Really? <laughs> really? Is that what you do? You, you sharpened me. You made you perfected me. You polished me. And then you concealed me. And then says, he has also made me a secret arrow. A secret arrow. Arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. See, in a battle, the real outcome of the battle is determined when the enemy king is going to die. You can go and kill everybody else in the other army. But unless and under the ruler or the king of the other party is, is destroyed, you know, unless that main leader is taken down, the battle is still going on. The battle is still going on. So sometimes the masters are, you know, if you go to a battle, you know, very often there are two different kinds of heroes, right? Like, you know, some heroes are, you know, I don't want to use the movie analogy, so, but, but there, are some, there are some movie heroes where they go with this big machine gun and, you know, it's just so heroic. The, the whole thing, they kill so many different uh, people and they, they shoot down helicopter. There is fire and smoke all over the screen. And, I mean, obviously, you have never, I mean, some of, I mean, some of you have been in war zone, but I've never been. But, but he, that, that's a spectacular, heroic action uh, thing we see. But then there are some kind of other heroes. They are actually hidden. And they are snipers. Like, you know the word snipers? They don't go out with their machine gun and do, 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 do. Nobody will ever know them. Nobody will even know that they exist. They go with this very precise rifles and they go and hide in, in some specific places, and they will hide there for days and months sometime because they, they have given a specific target. They will be asked to take down some of the key people of the enemy field. It doesn't matter how many other soldiers, he doesn't have to worry about other soldiers, but he has to, the one shot he is going to make is going to determine the outcome of the war, the one shot. But that shot has to be so perfected. The guy who goes with the ta -ta 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 -ta, he, he doesn't have to be perfected. All you need is the machine, right? If the machine gun is there, we can also do this and, you know, whatever killing you wanted to do, you can do that. But a sniper has to be so precise, he has only one shot, he better get it right or, the, or his cover is blown. And when it is done, he will swipe off his fingerprints and he will leave the scene and he as if he never existed. You will never ever hear about him. You will never know him. Except the president of the United States. Because he is very precious to the president because the chief of, uh, he, you know, he is the, he's the captain of the whole army. Like the, point of, the point I'm trying to make is, we don't have to all be over concerned about the spiritual warfare and to get into that big battle. And all we need to do is to remember that the battle belongs to the Lord 
And our job is to be prepared to be deployed when he is going to send us out. So preparation. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Because in this verse we read from the book of Corinthians, it talks about we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. So this is a preparation that is happening even inside our being, inside our heart or mind. The speculations and the lofty things that is raising up, raising up against the knowledge of God. So this preparation almost like, you know, suddenly I, I'm reminded of John the Baptist preparing for the arrival of the real fighter. And John the Baptist said, no, no, I'm not the fighter. I'm not here to fight. I'm not good at this. But I am preparing the field, the battlefield, for the arrival of the true fighter, the true hero. And he said, not he said, the prophecy of Isaiah, every valley should be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought down. And every crooked street will be become straight. You remember? So that is the preparation. That is almost like the preparation Paul is talking about. Every destroying, every speculation, every lofty things that is rising up against the knowledge of God, the field has to be leveled here in this promised land. Because, now this is the interesting part. In this battle, battlefield plays a big role as much as the fighters themselves. So I'll explain this. You know, we all know cricket, right? You know, cricket. Very often when we talk about cricket, uh, the people in America say, oh, cricket, we have seen cricket. It's like baseball, right? Uh, no, it is not like baseball. There is a big difference between cricket and baseball. Because in cricket, the field determines the outcome of the match. So if you go to a, you know this, when a cricket match is done in a particular stadium, there is this talk about whether it is a slow pitch or a fast pitch, because if it is a slow pitch, it is better for the spin bowlers to go and do this. And if it is a fast pitch, you need fast bowlers to do this. So based on the pitch, the way the strategy will be completely different. Because in baseball, a pitcher throws the ball and the batter just hits the, ba hits the ball. That's what is happening, right? The ball doesn't touch the ground. But in cricket, the, the ball has to touch the ground. The ball doesn't have to, but it normally does because that's the, that's the magic of the game. How the ball is going to, to touch the ground and come up, that's where the, the trick, that's a big difference between cricket and baseball, right? So in baseball, it is just between the pitcher and the batter. But in cricket, it is between the bowler and the batsman and the pitch and the pitch. The pitch plays a very, very important role in this. The pitch is actually is the battlefield, and the battlefield determines the outcome of the battle, right? Now, we are the battlefield, and it is important to know that very often this, the, what, the, the, the battle that is raging within us between the Holy Spirit and the evil spirit is affected by our preparation of the battlefield. Actually, that is the only thing we need to do. All we need to do is to, is to prepare the pitch. Like this grounds boys who walk around and before the game starts, you know, they, they go with a big roller and clear the area, clear the field. That's all we are going to do. Don't pretend that you are the captain of this team and you are this big star baller or the batsman of the other team. No. This is not up to you. This is not your battle. If you are going to fight this battle, you are not going to win. All you need to do is just be that grounds boy. Make sure the, the, the ground is all right. This is why I asked you to listen to that particular phrase that is being repeated in the book of Leviticus. You remember in the Leviticus, it says, the land will spew you out. It is an active verb which is being used. Actually, the, you know, it's only used five or six times in the Bible, that particular word. Even in English, it sounds very archaic, right? And uh, you can ask the resident Hebrew expert here, but 
the, it is the same word which is used. You remember when the, in the Jonah story, when the, when the whale or the fish actually spit out Jonah, it is the same word which is being used. The whale spewed out Jonah. So it is almost like this land has a, some kind of a personality. It is not the Lord doing, it is not the people doing, but the land itself will spew you out if you defile it. Now that's very interesting. The promised, the promised land has a personality of its own. It is almost like an organic entity. It is not just the land. See, that's why when you read the book of Leviticus, it's very interesting. It is important that the people give Sabbath to the land. Every six years, after cultivation of six years, you have to leave the land free for a year. Because the land has to enjoy, the word used is enjoy the Sabbath. The land has to enjoy the Sabbath. And also it is said, when the Israelites come back, from, you know, come from Egypt and take over the land, they were asked not to eat from the fruit of the land for the first three years because the land is already defiled by the Amorites who have lived there. So it is, you can see that connection between the, between the physical land and the spiritual action or, or you know, the, spirit, the, the, the spiritual reality and the physical reality. And it is not something that started there. In the book of Genesis, we see, we see the Lord said, curse be the land because of you. What did the poor land did? I mean, the land didn't do anything. But because of Adam's action, the land was cursed. So there is this connection between human action and what is happening in the environment and the world? I'm not talking about global warming or anything here. All I'm saying is the land has a personality and the land is fighting this war. That's what I want you to know. The land is playing a role in this war. There is a verse in um, Romans, okay, Romans 8, 19 to 21. This is what it says about the land which is currently subjected to corruption because of human sin, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, because the land didn't want to be subject to futility, not willingly, but because of our sin, the Lord had to do this, and then it says, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery. The right now, the land, the creation is subject to slavery and the land, like us, is also waiting for his freedom at the arrival of the Son of, Son of God. And that is that glorious day. The land itself is looking for that future, the glorious future. The point I'm trying to make is there is a spiritual consequence to the physical thing that is happening around us and vice versa. There is a physical consequence to some of the spiritual decisions we are making too. And we, all we need to do right now is to prepare our heart, our battlefield, so that the Holy Spirit can come and fight for us. See, the problem with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> it's not a problem, but you know, from our perspective, the problem with the Holy Spirit is that he is holy. He cannot go into a land which is unholy by definition. If Holy Spirit comes to a defiled land, the defiled land will spew him out. Just as the evil spirit comes to a holy land, the holy land will spew the evil spirit, evil spirit out. Does that make sense? So the Holy Spirit cannot just come because you ask him to come, even if he wants to come. See, this is very, very important. So let me take you to a, a you know, scripture where, you know, when John the Baptist was introducing Jesus, there's an inter interesting thing he says. John the Baptist was baptizing somebody, baptizing different people, and he said he didn't really recognize the Messiah, but God had given a sign for him to know who the Messiah is, okay? So this is the sign. This is, let me read from John chapter 1, 
32 to 33. John chapter 1, 32 to 33 says this. I have seen, so this is John the Baptist is saying, I have seen the Spirit of God descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. Watch the word, he remained upon him. And then, you know, then again further down he says, I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Essentially, John the Baptist is saying, when I am baptizing many people, maybe the Holy Spirit will descend on many people. That's not the point. The Lord said, there is only one person in whom the Holy Spirit will not only descend, he will remain. Watch for that person. That is the Messiah. That is the Messiah. See, that's the problem with the Tao. You know, I don't know how many of you have, you know, when the, 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 the place where I lived, there was a church nearby and there was a lot of doves in that church. And the dove is such a, just opposite to the pigs. You know, they cannot go, if, if the place is filthy, if the place is unclean, the dove won't fly into that area. They always keep to themselves. And the, dove, the doves have wings. So they will fly away when they don't like something. If the Holy Spirit came as a book, the book won't fly away. If the Holy Spirit came as a chair or whatever, or as a, as a robe or something and sat on Jesus or any of us, we don't have to worry. Unless and until we pull it out, it's not going to go away. But the Holy Spirit have, has wings. He will live when he doesn't like things. He will be spewed out by the defilement of our heart. The battle which is raging, the cap, you know, the, 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 the speculations and every lofty things that is rising against the knowledge of God, will that land will spew the Holy Spirit out and invite the other evil spirit who is a vulture, who is feeding. And that's exactly what the evil spirit wants. The evil spirits want filth like the vulture that is gathering near uh, a dead body or rotten and dirty things. And there comes the vulture. And we invite him in, depending on how we keep the land, how important it is to keep the land. There is this principle uh, you, in, in many fields. It says, garbage in, garbage out. Very often, we fill our hearts and our minds with a lot of garbages. Because the thoughts that is coming into our mind, into our heart, and it is being constantly poured on our life through media or wherever you turn it. And that is why, the, 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 why Paul says that take captive of every thought, right? That's exactly what it says. We are destroying and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The, the thoughts are going to come in, whether you like it or not. They're going to bombard you from wherever it is going to come. And there is this verse, uh, you know, a famous quote attributed to Martin Luther. This is what Martin Luther said. You cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. So it is very natural for all of us to go through these experiences because thinking is not something we can always control. But we can always decide what are the thoughts we are going to entertain because that determines whether we are going to defile this land or not. It's not the thought in themselves, but the thought we are going to be allowed to entertain. The thoughts are coming to you like, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a bad analogy, but like, a, like an immigrant caravan, right? You know, uh, or illegal uh, aliens or whatever. Like this is a big hot topic in the culture now. They're going to bombard you at your wall or at the gate, whatever you have. And I don't care whether you, you know, like I said this before, like I'm not, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, and I'm, I'm a Canadian, so I don't care about the politics. But it is important for us to build a wall in this promised land. I don't care about the America, whatever wall you're going to build in the, I would really like you to build a wall in the Canada-American border so that, you know, you can avoid some of the Americans escaping to Canada. Right, Ashley? <laughs> you know, our beautiful country. <laughs> so anyway, sorry, 
I don't remember where I was. Yeah, so the point is, the point is, you know, we need to build a wall around this promised land. We need to make sure that every thought that is showing up at this gate is checked, fingerprinted, scanned, and security check. They have to go through security check, and then only they are allowed to come in. And it is not just the evil thoughts. Every thought. Now, that's very important. Sometimes we think that, you know, only the evil thoughts are evil. No. Actually, there are a lot of neutral thoughts, which become very, very, very evil. In the sense, you know, our mind is processing a lot of garbage. We don't really need to know a lot of things we think we need to know. You know, so all this information overload, as we say, right? Like, you know, we hear this information overload. And when it comes, you know, even the TV news. I mean, I was listening to one of my favorite professor uh, from Toronto, and he was saying that he has not uh, seen, watched. He is a, he's a very famous author. His book was sold 3 million copies in one year, last year. He's a very relevant and controversial figure, actually. And we're not going to say, say his name. Uh, amazing person, and uh, he said he has never watched TV news in the last 30 years. And the reason is, he says, the TV news is about what is happening on the day, and the next day it is not important. He said, a news that loses its relevance in a day is not news to me. I think that's an extreme position, but I thought I learned a little bit about that. You know, there's a, you know, um, I used to read... Uh, Sherlock Holmes, I don't know, you, you know Sherlock Holmes, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes is the great, world's greatest detective. I remember I was a teenager, I got, went and bought all the Sherlock Holmes books in Malayalam, because I couldn't read English that well at the time, and I read the whole thing. I think he has, there are 56 stories and four novels or something like that, and I was so fascinated by Sherlock Holmes and, and, the, and, and the idea and the, 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 the intellectual rigor in which he solves the case and all that. But one of the episodes, actually in, 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 in the earliest or maybe in the first novel, uh, there is something about Sherlock Holmes which is fascinating. So, you know, Sherlock Holmes is the detective and then they, he has an assistant called Dr. Watson. He's a very brilliant man, but he's the sidekick in the story. So there was this incident where one day, Dr. Watson realizes that Sherlock Holmes didn't know that this, the earth is revolving around the sun. It's such a basic knowledge, right? What do you mean? Like, you don't know. So Sherlock Holmes says, why should I know? It doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's funny. This is the quote from, you know, I, thought just, I just printed it out, just that thing. So when Sherlock Holmes is, uh, you know, he was surprised that he was, Sherlock Holmes is aware of the fact that the earth revolves around the sun. So Watson says, uh, uh, Watson says, how can this happen? Watson is shocked. So Sherlock Holmes says, what the deuce is to me? He interrupted impatiently. You say that we go around the sun. If we went around the moon, it would not make any, a penny worth of difference to me or to my work. Right? Of course, it's an extreme position. And then he goes on to say, it's funny, the skillful workman, this is interesting, the skillful workman is very careful, indeed, as to what he takes into his brain attic. Your brain is like an attic, that's what Sherlock Holmes says. He will have nothing but the tools which may help him in doing his work. But of this, he has a large assortment. Then he goes on to say that it is a mistake to think that the little room has elastic wall and we can distend to any extent. We think that, oh, we can have all this information in our mind and, you know, but then we will become better and better and no. It is the mind is not elastic. That's what... What he says, I'm sure the medical doctors will, may disagree with that, but from a practical purposes, I have seen that. The more information I take, the more irrelevant information I take, the more kitty cat videos on YouTube I watch, I watch a lot, so I'm confessing, <laughs> you know. The more I watch this thing, which is very harmless, you know, silly things, and you know, which I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about myself. The more I do it, the more distracted I become. In, in my other things, because my mind gets clouded about the irrelevant, harmful, uh, you know, neutral information. And one thing I learned from my daughter, actually, Emma, who is currently sleeping, <laughs> she's, she's tired of hearing to her dad, but, you know, she took a social media fast for two weeks. She, 
logged out of our Instagram and uh, Facebook or whatever other social media there, then I was surprised. Where is, because that's our way of spying on her, what she's doing. Suddenly she disappeared, right? Like, you know, what happened? <laughs> so she said she is going to take her college application very seriously. So for two weeks, she didn't go to any social media, two weeks or one month, I, I don't remember. But I thought that was a good thing I learned from my daughter. And because she didn't want to be distracted, she came up with a fantastic essay. She already got an admission from a very, very top university in Canada. And it, it's because she thought that irrelevant information at that time, I don't really have to know what my friends are eating right now, right now at this point, and which restaurant are they in, or whether Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie are still married, or are they going to get back together, who is going to win the Oscar tonight, and these, these kind of things are harmless, it's harmless, but it is going to cloud your attic, and your attic is not elastic. And that's what the Sherlock Holmes said. Sometimes, that's why Paul said, Taking every thought captive, not the bad thoughts. It's much easier to take the bad thought captive because we know the bad guy when you see a bad guy, right? But this harmless, silly, simple things that come into our head, that's what makes our head a garbage can. Garbage in, garbage out. And that becomes a feeding ground for vultures. And the dove will never come around that. Because the dove represents the Holy Spirit. A defiled land will spew out the Holy Spirit. And a holy land will spew out the evil spirit. So remember that that's our duty to keep this land clean. This is the promised land God has given us. Let us go to him. Allow him to fight the battle. Very often we don't allow him. We don't let him. And the Holy Spirit wants to come and fight for us. But we can't. he can't because we are not preparing the land. So as we are preparing, as Walson Engel said, you know, as we are taking this 20 minutes of time and reading this and preparing to us the time for our retreat and make sure and ask the Lord, Lord, I'm preparing myself. I want the Holy Spirit to show up in my life and fight this battle for me because I tried to fight this battle. I tried to be the hero. I tried to be everything, but I can't. I failed because I don't have the courage and I don't have the strength. I want you to come into me and I want you to fight this battle. And that battle you're going to fight and the doubt you are, you're going to, as a doubt you're going to come and in my heart, it is going to remain in me. It's not going to end with the retreat. When I come back on Tuesday, the dove is still going to remain. The Holy Spirit is still going to remain because my land, I'm going to keep it so pure that the battle will be won for the Lord and the Lord of the armies will be in my life and he will take over my life and that is how we enter the true promised land and the fulfillment of the prophecy.